And I think we'll get underway. Welcome, yeah. everyone. Uh, great nice. to be back nice. at um, the Levatnik nice. School in this fantastic um, lecture theatre. Uh, this is a different session to what we've done before because we're open to other participants and very warm welcome to everyone who's come today. Uh, this is the Commission on State Fragility, Growth and Development. Today we are examining the issue of state legitimacy. Um, how much of a difference does it make to helping uh, fragile states if their governments and institutions are seen as legitimate, if they're able to get people to pay their taxes, obey the law, um, how much does that matter? And I think it's worth, before we dive into these excellent contributions we're going to have from our witnesses today, to sort of just remember that we're trying to answer some quite basic questions. How much does state legitimacy really matter? How do we measure it? Uh, how can governments uh, help to improve it? How can the international community help governments to improve it? And of course, the, what is the real relationship between the fragility of a state and um, the legitimacy of its institutions and government? I think I come at it thinking it is very important that if you look at state failure in very fragile states, you'll often find they've had a very low level of legitimacy. But we shouldn't just bring our prejudices. We should be looking at the evidence and listening to ideas. And above all, it is worth remembering this commission is aiming to find a development roadmap to sort of set out for the future, future policies and interventions that NGOs, governments, international institutions should make, all based on the concept that pretty soon half of the world's poorest people will be living in fragile states. So some of the classic elements of aid and development, um, which might go on being useful, but some of them won't be as relevant when we look at how we help the most fragile states. Anyway, thank you very much for our contributors this morning. We're going to this afternoon, we're going to hear from um, four people and unlike last time we're going to hear everybody's sort of opening hopefully five or six minute statement and then there'll be questions from the commissioners, then we're going to break at 2.15 and then we're going to come back and then we'll have more questions from the commissioners but also draw in others who want to ask questions. I'll try and keep to time um, and the running order is going to be first we're going to hear from Keith Biddle uh, who was a former Inspector General of Police for Sierra Leone after long experience um, in British policing. Then we're going to hear from Praveen Gordon, former Minister of Finance, South Africa. Then from uh, Mr. Hedy Larby, former Minister of Economic Infrastructure and Sustainable Development in Tunisia. And then Professor Christina Murray, UN Senior Advisor on Constitutions and Power Sharing. You very kindly all provided written submissions, which have been very helpful for us to read in advance. But we look forward to your hopefully provocative, punchy, insightful <laughs> opening statements. Um, and I hope we can spend as much time trying to learn from you and then think about the practical implications and the practical policy changes that we should therefore be recommending to governments and the international community. Keith, we're going to start with you. Very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, may I thank you for inviting me. It's uh, a pleasure after so many years to actually come and... Uh, address an audience oh, as powerful as this. So I'll try and be brief because you've given me five to seven minutes on what is a, a subject when I spoke to the Harvard um, oral uh, exercise some years ago. I took about five and a half hours. So uh, <laughs> I'll try and do it in one sixtieth of the time. Right, first of all, um, let me say that police reform cannot be done in a vacuum. You cannot just go to, say, a country like South Africa or Sierra Leone or Uganda or Papua New Guinea and reform the police. If you do, it will not change the fragility of that state. It will not make the government any better. It will not improve the lives of ordinary people because police in itself <coughs> will not change, will not change the fragility of a state or poor governments. But policing is actually germane to success of change. So you've got to do the police, but it's the right sequence and it's got to be done in conjunction with the justice system, with the health and welfare systems, with social government, with the military reform. It must be done as part of a, a much broader programme. And right from the outset, those who do it and those who support it, such as international development organisations, international NGOs and governments have to realise that this is a generational issue. 
Now, whether that's it, how long a generation is, um, I guess somewhere between 25 and 30 years. So if you turn up in Sierra Leone in July 1998, as we did, and think you can leave in three years, then you've not worked it out properly. It's a 20, 25 year project. And the thing about Sierra Leone, there are still British projects, French projects, and UN projects in operation in Sierra <coughs> Leone today with the military, with the police, the justice sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when I say generational, I'm talking about long term. So your planning at the beginning has to be as to have a view as to what things might look like in 20 years' time. And who's going to lead it in 20 years' time? And what's your, what are your policemen and your soldiers and your civil servants going to look like in 20 years' time? So what I'd say is you, you've got to do precisely what the South Africans did between about 1992 and 1994. The ANC sent a lot of people throughout the world looking particularly at policing, which was a major issue for the South Africans present will know that in the run-up to Mandela's election in 1994, policing was a major concern to everybody. And it wasn't exactly the best. But what, what you've got to realise about South Africa is they did not need the international community to build them training schools. They got training schools all over the country. How they were managed <coughs> under the apartheid regime made them pretty ineffective. But the buildings were there. They didn't need vehicles. They got loads and loads of vehicles. They didn't need communications. They didn't need police stations building in most of the country. In some of the townships, they needed police stations. So they weren't after money from the international community to rebuild their police. What they wanted was help and expertise to help them develop their solution to their policing. And I emphasize there for the simple reason that if you do what they want, rather than what you think is good in your country, then you will probably succeed in the end because it's what's wanted by the people you're there to help. And there are too many people go from international development organizations and developed nations and go to Sierra Leone and say, this is how we do it in my country, this is how you're going to do it. And I tell you now, having been a chief of police in one of these countries, if anybody came in my office and said that, I'd almost switch off and as quickly as I could, I'd ask them to leave. And as politely as I could. I didn't want their solution. I needed them to help me come up with the solutions that the Sierra Leonean people wanted. And that is a very key issue in this subject of reform. And I don't think it only applies to police reform. It applies to reforms of all other issues if you're trying to correct a fragile and a conflicted, a conflict affected state. So you're better off doing what the South Africans did, but not everybody can do it, where you've got the brain power that you could send overseas. They came up with an idea that they wanted a community-based policing system based on the Scarman report. And I remember seeing um, Fink Hasem and Janine Rausch for the first time round about the 1st of May 1994 and suggesting, are you sure? Because I was never certain that the Scarman system works as efficiently as the report said it would. And they said, this is what we want for South Africa and we just need your help. We don't need you to tell us what to do. And from then on, we followed the South African diktat. And they were very successful for about 10 years plus. Now it's perhaps regressed a bit. Now in Sierra Leone, very quickly, when I went there, we knew very little. And we went through a process of saying, OK, what is the situation today? We were then given a set of notes by President Kaba that he presented to the last military <coughs> government that said, this is the kind of police force that we want. Community-based, a police force that respects human rights and so on. He then, when he was elected, having used that as part of his manifesto to be elected, he appointed Dr Banya, later the foreign minister, and a former commissioner from the immediate post-colonial era, uh, Jenkins Smith, and another man to do a thorough 
commission under Chapter 11 of the Constitution of Sierra Leone. And they came on and said they wanted a police force that's a friend of the people, that listens to the people, and delivers what the people want in accordance with the laws and constitution of Sierra Leone. And so the way forward was then to produce that kind of police force and give them ideas and spend a lot of time with civil society, with police officers, with military people, with people in government, um, go around the country and speak to people. And as most of the country was in the hands of the rebels, we used local radio to do that. And we got comments back from all over. And this is the kind of policing they wanted. They wanted Sierra Leone policing, not some model from Britain or France or Germany or Australia or from the UN in New York. They wanted their model to be delivered. And so the strategic development plan that followed from that <coughs> followed that model. So I think that works. And I've seen it not work where you get too many people assisting too many different nations in the DRC. They liked that approach. And then other people came in and said, we won't support that, we'll, but we'll support this. And it all became bitty. And I think the DRC now has not moved as far as it could have done. Had it taken a view, we have a plan and we want you to help us develop this plan. And that was the main thing I learned from South Africa. And it's actually informed my thinking as I've work, worked around the world over the last 20 years. <coughs> so for the nitty gritty and the bits and pieces, I'll be happy to answer any questions on that. But I just thought I'd emphasize this, taking an approach that suits the people of the country in question. Keith, that's very Thank, you. Thank you. We'll, we'll come back to your written evidence <coughs> about detail about how <coughs> should be set up under the law mm -hmm. rather than part of the government. We might want to examine yeah. a bit of that. Um, as well as the, your, your very helpful remarks. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Praveen Gordon, who is Finance Minister of South Africa. Um, South Africa, a, a great example of incredibly strong state legitimacy after the election of President Mandela, but lots of difficulties and issues emerging subsequently. So it would be very interesting to hear your reflections on how states build legitimacy for their institutions and what things others can do to help. Sometimes, as Keith has just pointed out, sometimes there's interventions that, that they're <coughs> very warm welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And forgive me for coughing occasionally. I think <coughs> there's four broad points. Firstly, thank you very much for the invitation um, and for this opportunity to share the South African experience. I have a fellow South African on the panel as well. So I'm sure uh, both of us will represent uh, both our glory and our problems uh, <laughs> adequately. The first point is, is that many of the challenges that we uh, would see in fragile states or in respect of fragile states, I think today uh, would be applicable to both developed and developing countries. And so as you look at the legitimacy question uh, in respect of fragile states, you might suddenly find your brief increasing uh, to look at what, what is the problem of legitimacy generally in respect of the state and, and governments as well. And the points I make in the brief note that I sent to you is that ultimately uh, the legitimacy of states and governments depends on people's direct experiences and, and perceptions. We have uh, some wise words from an African revolutionary, Amilcar Cabral, people don't eat ideas, they eat bread uh, or whatever is available. And at the end of the day, if states and governments cannot deliver that, they, they lose, the, lose their legitimacy. Secondly, it's the actual experience of citizens uh, of the economy, politics, and development, not the ideas, the policy papers, and the laws that matter. <coughs> and, and again, I think both in uh, your part of the world, so to speak, and ours, uh, there are interesting challenges and observations that are arising uh, from that, because we all can present these issues in a fanciful way, uh, or sometimes in an abstract way, but uh, don't give enough attention to how people actually perceive these things, uh, or developments around us. And then when the opportunity comes to lodge a vote in one or other occasion, uh, we, we begin to see interesting results uh, emerging from that. The third is, is uh, in, in a sense, reflective of what going on in South Africa today, but elsewhere in the world as well. Some serious questions are being asked 
about what do states represent, which class interests, which sectoral interests, uh, how does, uh, as you know, in South Africa, state capture has become a popular phrase. Uh, so that in, the, in the last 20 or 30 years, the World Bank talked about policy capture, but I think we've moved on uh, to different elements of capture uh, by elites and sexual interests. And what impact do they have, particularly in fragile states, which might not have the resilience to resist some of uh, uh, the, these sorts of uh, developments? I think a big question around the world today is uh, GDP growth beneficial to all? And how is that to be actually reflected? And growth and development, obviously, uh, and their relationship is a crucially and uh, much debated issue at the, at the moment. Uh, but serious questions are being asked, as you know, about globalization, deglobalization, uh, the 1% versus the 99%, whether that's in the US and the UK, uh, or in our own countries as well. And uh, South Africa is certainly one of the most unequal societies in the world and confronts this on, on, on a key basis. A crucial question that's arising from more, some of the more recent experiences is, are institutions of the state allowed to pursue their democratic mandate or their constitutional mandate freely? Uh, or what's the relationship between political influence the party that might be in government, and what uh, bureaucrats or administrators in institutions are uh, mm -hmm. permitted to do. I mean, if you take the example of tax authorities, uh, nominally they can apply uh, the tax collection mechanism to anybody in society. Mm -hmm. But uh, one phone call to a prime minister or a minister of finance or some influential figure in government, in many situations, suddenly finds uh, certain parts of society exempt. Uh, if one puts it euphemistically, uh, from, their tax, uh, from their tax obligations. The, the, the uh, issue of money in democratic processes, a uh, relationship between moneyed people and political parties, moneyed people and, and politicians, and indeed administrators as well, I think becomes a bigger issue in uh, developing countries, but you can see it elsewhere in the world today as well. It is disguised often as Russian influence or some other influence in one form or another. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, that ordinary folk uh, all over the world are questioning the democratic process. They're asking whether, apart from their vote, how do they actually influence uh, decision makers? And what leverage do they actually have? Uh, and in our own situation, uh, there's a huge dynamism developing among civil society to act as some kind of uh, counterintuitive force in, in many of these instances as well. And perhaps uh, the other question that we need to pursue and perhaps look at from your point of view is the cultural and ideological influences on citizens, the kind of narratives that develop, uh, and particularly in this so-called post-factual fake news society, uh, the role of big media and other mm -hmm. interest groups and. Uh, how they can actually influence things in one way or another. In terms of uh, our own experience in, in, in state building, uh, just to mention a few issues, and we can come back to some of this uh, a little later. The, the big uh, shock, if you like, to the South African system was how does a state system uh, and government move from a pre-1994 situation where you serve a minority to serving uh, that's five or six million people serve, or, or serving now 50 million people. And uh, I think it's a formidable challenge to reorganize the state according to a new constitutional regime uh, and set up the administrative mechanisms that would deliver even just basic services uh, to, to South Africans. The second big question is to what extent does legacy matter? Uh, we often think that once you have a new constitution like in South Africa, and perhaps elsewhere in the world, you actually have a, a cut in history, uh, and you start on a clean note thereafter. But there are, I'm sure there are academics and others here who can talk about uh, the issue of past dependency and how the past influences the present and whether and how the present lays a template for the future. And how easy is it to break this in policy uh, and, and practical terms, and, or how difficult is it? The third issue uh, is a lot of our focus in the initial years 
was on access, a minority having access to good education versus a majority having access to good education. But now the shift needs to happen from increasing access to increasing quality and, and outcome, because that is what really makes the positive impact uh, on, on citizens' lives at the end of the day. We also had a unique situation, which you probably find elsewhere in the world. Um, as you might remember, we had many so-called Bantustan structures, four fake states, uh, nine self-governing territories, each with their own administrations, and something like, what, 13 to 15 education departments post-1994 had to be put together into one and then divided into nine provinces. Uh, but in, at a micro level, it's just fascinating how one has to combine the old and the new, uh, because you can't tell all the old civil servants, uh, take a hike, so to speak, because part of the compromise uh, in the negotiation process was all of them will retain their jobs, all of them will retain their pensions, uh, but new people would enter in senior and other positions as, as well. The challenge of, of creating a professional uh, civil service is one that I think we still face uh, at, at, at the moment, and uh, that's a challenge that we, we, we need to actually uh, take on. Perhaps let me stop there, and in, in our future interactions, we, we can take up some of the other issues. It's safe to say that uh, the, the connection between politics uh, and the state and government uh, and what society is actually experiencing uh, of us is probably the key issue that we confront. And together with politics, what elites and politicians uh, do to guide a country in a, in, a, in a particular direction. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, for that last sentence. It means that we're on the right subject today, which <laughs> is uh, always encouraging. Um, can I welcome um, Ed Navi from um, Tunisia, the, the, the bright spark of the Arab Spring? <laughs> Um, and obviously huge knowledge and experience of seeing a transition from one form of government to another form of government and now to a, another form of government, uh, one all the time the issue of the legitimacy of state institutions must have been very important and perhaps something that helped to take you through this process. So we'd be very interesting to hear your experiences, but well. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, inviting me. Actually, uh, uh, I, um, because of the topic that uh, Rafat actually sent to me, I uh, tried to reread the uh, Tunisian transition from a legitimacy angle. And if uh, I, I kind of came up with the idea that the Tunisian transition, if there is one single feature, is really that permanent quest for legitimacy. And, and that's fundamental. That's a, if you look at the timeline of the transition, which was uh, very, really very turbulent, uh, if you look at it from inside and uh, the different conflicts that it generated, uh, just a few days after the, the, the uprising, no one single institution were, was considered as legitimate. And we were find ourselves in a sort of legitimate void. There was a sort of institutional void. So how can you get out of uh, a, a sort of institutional void because the parliament was dismantled, people didn't even recognize the security forces, only the state structure, not the state institution that would recognize it because we needed to deliver public services and that's the only thing that was in place. How so, how you get to a sort of a transition, a process that is accepted by the people and considered as legitimate. So two months of public debates and uh, uh, demonstration and appraising everywhere, we came up with that kind of consensus on the transitional process that led to, uh, I'm going very fast here, uh, and that actually process was considered legitimate up under a number of conditions, that we do the, um, the election on time, that the election are democratic and free, that the whatever uh, national constituent assembly will deliver on exactly that road map. And, and that people actually were extremely uh, vigilant in watching this, so that uh, that little legitimacy uh, keeps actually uh, safe. And so we got that election 2011, and here we have a sort of a new National Constituent Assembly to frame the constitution, and we have also an interim, uh, uh, an elected government, which called the Troika, led by the Islamists, and here again we got back to some sort of institutional and political legitimacy. 
Yet, it didn't work. That legitimacy, legitimacy didn't stand the test of time. And why? Because those who have been elected actually didn't deliver what they promised and why the people actually uh, elected them. One, the constitution, the Islamists wanted really to kind of put their mark. And they questioned the kind of moderate Islam. And they said that Tunisians have never been good Muslims. And they need now to be a good Muslim and to live up to the sort of Islamic values. And that people said, why did we didn't actually uh, uh, elect you to uh, bring us back to what you think the Islam should be, etc. And second, they totally ignored the real causes of the revolution, which was the economic and social grievances of the people. So it's not only about politics, the revolution and the uprising. It was the economic and social. And just here, again, to go very quickly, civil society came out, and they organized, actually, demonstration and uprising. And the whole legitimacy of that democratic process disappeared. And that was called into question. And called into question because they wanted the government to be disbanded. They wanted the National Constituent Assembly to be actually uh, disbanded as well and to go through a new type of uh, process. But here again, that's why I said the quest for legitimacy. Uh, there, there should be something. We cannot just dismantle a sort of institution like the National Constituent Assembly. Maybe the government, but not that one. And that's because of the illegality and the culture of legality in Tunisia. When we look at it, actually, it dates back to the 17th century. Tunisians are very kind of attached to the legality of things, to legal things. And that's fundamental. So, but they want to give a sort of a new legitimacy, even if they are questioned that a process which was democratically uh, recognized. And here again, uh, we came up with this, what we call the, uh, the national dialogue, which is civil society, came to kind of redefine the rules of the game with regard to the transition of process. And this is where they uh, kept the National Constituent Assembly as elected, but they asked the government actually to step down. And they designated uh, a new uh, government, which is, uh, that's why I became part of this uh, last transition government. But the most important thing is that the national dialogue redefined the principle of the new constitution. So even the National Constituent Assembly was not trusted enough because the majority was the Islamists and some of their allies. They were not trusted enough to keep actually working and writing the constitution. And that's fundamental. Here, the factor of trust is fundamental. If we don't trust institution and don't trust people, it is very, very difficult to keep some level of legitimacy. And that's what uh, I learned from the Tijin case. So when we came in the government, and that's, uh, we questioned ourselves, how much actually legitimacy do we have? We have been designated. We are not elected. The National Constituent Assembly, the majority is in the Islamists who lost actually uh, power and government. So we're not going to be much supported in the, in the parliament. That was uh, clear for us. And we were a kind of technocrat. So how can we build some legitimacy and do something for the people? And what we did uh, uh, after a few, actually, uh, session, uh, brainstorming and discussion, we said, what is missing? If the political process, in terms of transition, has been defined, and now it has some legitimacy because of the national uh, dialogue, and that's everybody recognize it, what is missing is delivering to the people on the social and economic. So our focus was, and I agree with you both, is really how to deliver to the people and build, step by step, some trust. In, in my case, for instance, I immediately engaged with the, the staff of the ministry who didn't believe in anything. That political transition, even the uprising, this, they don't even know whether we will have a real institute, but, uh, constitution. But what, what they felt is they have been manipulated, one by the politician and especially by Islamists, who changed the number of the high officials in the ministries. In, in, in including this ministry. So they thought that this is going to be a game and we're going to have a sort of political crisis every three to six months and that we're going to uh, get out of it. So what we did actually first is build some confidence, some trust within the institution. 
And that's fundamental. So engage with the people. Let them actually talk about their own grievances, their problems, and how they see their institution emerging. And in a way, bringing or earning some, some trust from the people. And then engaging with the people and what were their priorities. Of course, economic and uh, actually social demands of the people were huge. Nobody would actually meet this uh, level of uh, uh, demands. But at least we engage in a very thorough, deep discussion on what would be the priorities given the limited capacity we have and the limited financial uh, uh, actually resources we have. And we agreed on uh, a sort of priority program and we focused only on two things. One, build the institutional capacity to deliver and second, deliver as much as we can. And that is, it. and the third thing which is important, I don't want to forget it, Communicate, 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 get information out to the people. The people actually, even during the first phase of the transition, were not that much informed. That was kind of hijacked by the politician and by the, uh, uh, and by the political debates, but nothing was actually said to the people on how the process was doing, where we are, what are the problems we have facing, what can, how can we do actually to address such and such a problem. And I think if there, if there is a lesson is a trust, is fundamental, is the key element, constituent of any type of legitimacy. Democratic legitimacy is not enough. Even if you are elected, you need to deliver to the people, and you need to be fair, you need to be open, and you need really to communicate and inform the people. There are a number of questions, actually, we can come to this later, if you wish, but that's, uh, I, I leave it to the debate. Thank you. We had a big debate this morning amongst the Commission about how much of legitimacy depends on delivery and how much depends on processes and fairness and perceived impartiality. And uh, you, you put your cards very clearly down on delivery being the thing that mattered the most. I'm sure we'll come back to that in the questions. Finally, I'm um, Christina Murray. Very warm welcome from the UN. I suppose in, in the work we're trying to do, we're looking at how the international community can help with the issue of state legitimacy. In the past, that's involved a lot of work on um, mediation processes and constitution, um, uh, the, the drawing up constitutions and trying to uh, apply them correctly, something I know you've had a lot of experience with. And I suppose we're looking again at which bits of this work, which bits don't work, which bits should we do more of, which should we do less of, and we're hoping you're going to give us some guidance. So um, over to you. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to answer your questions. <laughs> but um, And as a starting point, let me say, I think my cards are firmly on the economic delivery, the substance de delivery point as well. So let me declare that interest to begin with. Um, I suppose as a lawyer, my professional life has been broadly concerned with the rule of law generally. Um, but as you've just said, uh, David, in the last perhaps 20 years it might be now, my main concern has been in constitutional processes and constitutional design. Um, and there's much to say about that. Um, I want to make just three points. But the background is that I think we agree that some clear and agreed constitutional arrangements, very clear rule of, rules of the game, as we've just heard them referred to, are necessary for state legitimacy. Um, and I'm setting aside now another complicated conversation one might have about whether one should be starting from the bottom up, as is argued in the case of Somalia sometimes, maybe an issue in Libya, in due course, or whether we take the nation state as it stands. Let me just set that aside and assume we're agreeing that one needs a national constitutional framework. And then, of course, in, I believe, in many, most fragile states, the constitution does not fulfill the role of supporting or sustaining or contributing to state legitimacy. Um, many reasons for this, but I think that some do relate to the process of constitution making and perhaps to a lesser extent to the substance of constitutions. So the three points. Um, well, the first one, in fact, all three of them probably, are, is trite. Um, and it's already been made. And that is that a constitutional settlement and constitutional reform can't stand on its own. Um, to use the words of my neighbor, um, one can't ignore the roots of the problem, particularly in states that are fragile and especially those emerging from conflict. And a meeting I attended earlier this week, a political 
conversation started edging away from political settlements to issues of economics and development. And the political scientists there made a strong assertion that the political settlement is the key issue in the debate. Um, and he would, argue, he would add the constitutional settlement to that part, the key, essential, most important part of any democratic transition. And that reminded me of an experience I had in Kenya when I was a member of the committee that prepared their new constitution. We spent some time um, traveling around the country, um, consulting with, doing public education really, and consulting with uh, members of the community. Um, on one occasion in the far north, which is an insecure and poverty stricken, um, we'd done our little bit, done the show, answered the questions, and afterwards, when we broke up, I was mobbed, as the only woman in the group, I suppose, I was mobbed by a group of women. Um, and they were angry. Angry that we were wasting resources, paying no attention to their real needs, um, security needs, education needs, and so on. Um, and I think we know that for a state to have any traction whatsoever, it needs to deliver at least uh, on security needs, uh, deal with corruption in some way, and then in a better world, more positively, deal with access to water, education, and so on. Um, and one of the problems with constitution-making processes and political settlements is that they, perhaps not always, it's dangerous generalizing in this field, but political settlements and political processes like that easily dominate um, attention. Um, I think Yemen provides a particularly stark example of that, um, but there are many others where political interests are so captured by this process of establishing a framework for governance that um, other interests are neglected. And as South Africans know, it is a very, very hard job to keep all those balls in the air. And South Africa is and never has been a fragile state. Um, we struggled, so the problem is much greater um, in fragile states. Um, it's particularly important not to have citizens watch while politicians on per diems are chatting about what are finally perceived as being the politicians' narrow interests while nothing changes in their lives. So the challenge is to how, how one can build that framework for, government, for the f governance for the future while also delivering in some way. But you made that point before me, so I will stop there. Then the second point is about the need for the agreement of the political elite. And again, this is a point that has just been made. Um, I know I've just argued that political agreement is not enough, but I think it's essential. And, the question that's worried me for a number of years is how much political agreement you should have before you, can, before you should really embark on a large constitution-making process. I think that what's been happening recently is political settlements have tended to push a lot of the difficult political bargaining into constitution-making processes. And I'm not convinced that a constitution-making process is the best way to deal with those core deals that may be necessary. Now, again, there are complicated questions of both vertical and horizontal inclusion on these issues, but it's something that we've paid very little attention to. The sort of standard roadmap has a constitution and elections equally dangerously quite early on. And the international community is particularly responsible for urging this. I think we find the forums used for constitution making are probably not ideal for hammering out an elite agreement. The constitution making agenda tends to be huge, overloaded really for focused decisions on core political matters or core matters of containing power, I should say. Um, there may not be adequate initial agreements to give the people participating at this stage the sort of safety, the protection of their interests to um, deal in a more reasoned way. It's never very reasoned, but a more reasoned way with constitutional decision making. I mean, I think that's one of the things that the South African process was blessed by, sort of strong 
political deals to begin with slowly built up, um, and then a bit of space to finalize the details. It's not a model that is easily um, repeatable. Um, and I think, actually, I realize I'm sitting next to a Tunisian where you just said you started really without that deeper political agreement. And it then had to be forged later in the process. Third point, more briefly, because it's also come up, is the question, sort of much more narrow question, of what we bring to these processes. Um, as constitutional reform can have a role in nation building, and we hope it does, but of course it's primarily there to establish the institutions and the practices of the state. And I suppose in a fragile state, almost by definition, the existing practices and institutions don't work. Um, but of course, as is well known, it's a really bad time to make up new institutions, to create new institutions, um, for all kinds of reasons that we could discuss. But I mean, the one most obvious one is the players in the game, people who hold power or some authority, um, are really reluctant to embark on or to embrace new institutions when they can't predict the outcomes or can't predict their political future. Um, I think every country knows this. Why it's so difficult to change electoral systems is one good example. Um, it plays out much more dramatically um, in states where the state itself really is the bearer of all access or is the forum for all access to wealth. Um, I mean, I can talk a little bit about the limits of the kind of advice, I suppose you might call it, that people like myself bring to <laughs> these processes. Um, I think we are generally too unaware of how we are constrained by our um, own histories and own experiences. Um, but the point that Mr. Biddle made at the beginning about the South Africans um, has struck me again and again as I've engaged with other people in constitution-making processes. South Africans, including um, Praveen Gordon, from whom I learned an enormous amount in our process, um, were wonderfully confident about their ability to engage in constitutional discussion. Thus, Fink Hasem's certainty that South Africans had thought through what policing model was good for us. Um, so the South Africans were open, remarkably open, to new ideas and remarkably willing to engage with people from all over the world, many of whom now claim to have written our constitution, um, but to engage with them and robustly and shake their ideas around and think about how they might apply in South Africa. I have never seen that again. Um, I've had that experience on a one-to-one -one basis and perhaps in very small groups in a number of countries, but I've never seen, well, in a, f in a more fragile situation, um, that kind of ability to engage. I've often puzzled about how one could build it. Um, so that's really my third point. Um, I think if we do constitution making badly, we may suffer long-term ill effects, um, but we don't really know how to do it well. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Christina. And what we're looking for here is hard-headed, practical suggestions for how we improve mm. uh, on state legitimacy. And you've, you've given us plenty to, to think about. Now, I've got lots of commissioners here who will all be bringing, brimming with questions, so I promise not to hog. But I'll just kick off with one question for Keith. But I think the way we should do it is if anyone has any questions for any one of the witnesses, we can do them in whatever order you like. We've got 45 minutes of just the commission, and then we'll take a break, and then come back, uh, and others can join in. Keith, let me just start with one Sort of, sort of question slash clarification. I thought you were very persuasive that you mustn't try and impose a policing model on another country. You've got to work with what they want and help them implement their model. However, in your evidence, you make the point, which I thought was very persuasive, that police forces and therefore states have greater legitimacy if the police is established under the law, not an arm of government. So would you qualify it to say, of course, you're trying to help put in place the model that countries want, but there are some basic ground rules of what a successful model looks like because the police must be under the law rather than above it. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that sort of where we are? Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly is the answer. I mean, if, if you look at the history of policing, I mean, probably the first document that was written worldwide, which is comprehensive, uh, are the Peel Principles, which he wrote 
between about 1825 and 1829. And the first one is, it says exactly that. It's about that the police work to the law and the law affects how people behave and the police are there to ensure that everything is done fairly and let's take the military out of that equation. That is his first one. But then in the next eight, it's all about involving the people to enforce the law fairly and in accordance with human rights, although the term human rights wasn't uh, used in there. But that's basically the best definition you'll get of what democratic policing is about. And so if you're an advisor that's in a country like Sierra Leone, you're probably quite fortunate that the constitution will be based on British colonialism, which means it's come from India rather than come from Britain. And it's codified. And so you, you've actually got it there. If you look at the Francophone countries, they're based in the, um, I've forgotten the year now, but the, the Droit des Hommes, the rights of man, from just after the revolution. And so the French constitution tells you exactly the same that you've got to comply with the law, the law has got to be obeyed, and the law must look after the rights of people. So that's something that, as an advisor, you have to sort of say, this is a bottom line, this is a key thing. Any particularly bad examples of police forces where you know, outside powers have tried to help but done it in completely the wrong way? Because I think we need to look for good practice <laughs> and bad. Well the, well, the bad example... I, hmm. I don't offend anybody, but the DRC is not very clever because the DRC had gone to pieces after the Belgians left. The Belgians didn't leave a police service in the Belgian Congo. They, they had um, First Public. the Garde Civile, which First I Public. think it was called, which wasn't a police force. It was a paramilitary organisation to keep the Belgians in power and had no, no regard for the majority of the people. They started in, uh, immediately after independence to try and put something in place, a proper gendarmerie and a proper police nationale in the cities. But that all went to pieces when Mobutu came in. And there's a superb book by Michaela Rong called Following the Footsteps of um, Dr Kursk, who, who is the uh, subject of Conrad's novel, The Heart of the Book. Not the heart of the matter. The heart of darkness. The heart of the matter is uh, Graham Greene on Sierra Leone. Sorry about that. So, so, the, so the Congo DRC is a complete mess. And then when the present government came in after the overthrow of um, Mobutu, they didn't do it. And they left it to the international community. And this is a genuine example. So the French come along and said, oh, we must interview, introduce a police intervention rapide, which is based on the CRS. The UN came along and said, oh, yes, you need form police units. We'll train form police units. Somebody else came in, the European Union, you need a unity police integrate, and they trained them. And somebody else did some training. I think it was the Angolans. So when they got into an emergency, they found that these four or five organisations had all been trained to different standards, with different words of command, different uh, standard operating procedures, and couldn't work together, and got in a complete mess in the back on door around Matadi, in, uh, right after the 2005 election. And that's how you fail, because what they did, these different groups, they brought what we do and then forced it. And the Congolese were not strong enough to realise that they were getting four different systems. And they, one day they would all have to work together. So there's one that um, didn't helpful. succeed. I wouldn't say failed, but it didn't that's succeed. That's really helpful. Right, questions. Um, Stephen, you want to come in? Yeah, so this is one question for each, and this is somewhat repeating what people have already said. Mr. Larby, so the conclusion I would draw from your presentation is that you cannot have legitimacy without having adequate performance. It completely contradicts what people have said this morning. So maybe some of our panelists from this morning could weigh in on that. Um, for, um, uh, for this question of, of security, what happens? I mean, you, you 
suggest, Mr. President, I mean, you should get, you should address security and corruption initially. What happens if they're in conflict with each other, which perhaps we have in Egypt, where you get security, but, but policing might also be corrupt? So what do you do under those circumstances? And for Mr. Biddle, I mean, is it a fair conclusion from your presentation that this, this term best practices, which the development community likes, if I can put it politely, is a lot of crap? that you really have to look at, you must look at local circumstances. And there is not really no such thing as best practices. Punching questions, we like that. Right. Um, mm. Mr. Lovey, why did okay. you start? Uh, thank you so much. What, what I said actually is that uh, thinking that just because we were elected, we are legitimate and we have legitimate institution, prove it to be really not sustainable if at the end of the day you don't deliver to the people. And that's fundamental. And to deliver, the, to, the, to deliver the, to the people, you need that legitimacy. That's the problem. And, but how do you build that legitimacy? And what I said is that, based on my experience in Tunisia, is trust is one of the critical key factor of any type of legitimacy that you want to build. And that you cannot have that trust if you don't deliver to the people. So people would like to see something happening for them. So some kind of institution that care for their needs. And that's, that's what my, my point. And that's fundamental. Can, can no, I just sorry. ask something on that? Because I was struck by something you said, which is you're saying it's all about delivery. And yet, to me, the Tunisian example is you went from Ben Ali to an Islamist regime, and then from an Islamist regime to a or, I would argue, secular, legitimate, democratic regime, and yet the, the state didn't fall apart. The institutions didn't fall apart. It, it seems to me as if there, there's something about the Tunisia case mm. where there are, there's quite strong legitimacy that links back to something that I don't understand. So it isn't all about delivery. Do you see what I mean? Can I add an addendum? Yeah. And I think there's also the interesting question of the role of civil society mm -hmm. and unions, <clears throat> which might have been yeah. part of the glue. And what, what, Role did that what play? was the glue? What something? held everything together while yeah. these changes were taking place? Maybe it was something you said about the Tunisian belief in things being legal and proper. Yeah. <laughs> actually, there are a few things. One is the Tunisian, that culture came actually, uh, I think, in, back in the 17th century for good reason, but it's not the place where to. There is a legalist a spirit out there. We want to see things done according to the law. And if there is, if there is no law, then we have to invent something that gives some level of legitimacy. And that, that's probably the thing that protected the transition process. I, I, I read a paper on this anyway. But some of the legal people, or the lawyers, are much better there. But what I'm saying, what kept actually things going in Tunisia, I don't think that the state as structures, yes, because they have always, first of all, Tunisia has been known for strong state structures because after independence, the state that has been built by Bourguiba was extremely well structured, organized, and staffed. So the, the delivery of public service kept going on. But a state institution, as I would say, rules and a government, et cetera, even today, they are not that much trusted because the, the, what, who, the, the people, what the people are seeing, actually, the structures are delivering to us. But if you look at the public policy and the policies of this government, etc., they are not adequate. And our economic and social condition didn't improve to the country. Actually, it's getting worse and worse. So how can we trust them? So actually, the, the legitimacy, I would say, of the structure, but not necessarily of state institution uh, as, as we know it, the rules of the games, the public policy things, the governments. Thank you. Um, Tom. So this is for Pravin and, uh, and Christina. So Pravin, uh, at one point you were minister for, for governance, I think. <coughs> and you saw these provinces in South Africa, democratically elected, had a legitimate, unable to deliver books for schools, unable to deliver very basic services. Mm. And I want to comment from you on how actually poor delivery undermines legitimacy and could actually, in the long run, lead to a fragile state. That's my first question. My second question for Christina. So you have the Kenyans put up a new constitution. 
In other words, from a Westminster Can you speak a little bit louder? Yes. So you help the Kenyans put up a new constitution. So they abandon Westminster constitution and have some kind of American constitution. A small country, 45 million people with 42 states, each with a governor and an assembly. And now Kenyans are saying this thing is too expensive, it's corrupt, so we have decentralized corruption. And legitimacy of institution is now put in question. You ask the Kenyans during this election. So I was going to ask you uh, a question arising from this, bearing in mind what uh, Keith said. Might the problem be also that uh, in many of these countries, there have been an attempt to copy foreign constitutions? And related to that, I want to ask you about the phenomenon known as uh, winner take all. That is, mm. you win the election, you take everything. Mm. And those who have lost, they have lost, and they have nothing on the table. And what this means for fragility. Brilliant. Just before sorry, I cut off, Stephen asked a question of Keith, which was asked all these international models for policing bank. Yeah, best practices, best yeah. practices. Yeah. security versus so corruption. Otherwise, we'll leave it. The, 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 general, the general impression from most experts, academic and practitioners, is the answer to best practice is community policing. Now, if I look around here, there must be at least 60 people in here. If I gave you all a blank piece of paper and said, you write your definition of community policing, I will put £20 on the table that we won't get the same answer from anybody. And that is a problem where people come and say community policing. So what we did in Sierra Leone, because that was the result, there's about 30 people in the room, and I said, you can't have community policing until somebody can tell me what it is. And nobody could. And so we distilled it down to its lowest common denominator, which is about involving the people in their decisions and taking policing down to the local level. Because what's a community? Is a community a locality? If you look at the Scarman report, one of the reasons I was a bit sceptical when Fink Hayson and Janine Rouse told me that they were going for Scarman community policing, it was based on British police divisions. But when I went to Kent, a big division like Ashford had places like Hythe, Dover, Folkestone, Deal. If you went to those towns and asked them if they were the same as Ashford, they'd, they'd have thrown you off the cliffs. It would be entirely different. So you have to have a, a separate police in form for each of those towns. So in, so in Sierra Leone, we actually redefined it to something called local needs policing as the basic. And it seems to be working because there is no best practice on community policing in the world. But it's a nice expression that everybody uses. <coughs> and a point that um, Christina made. When I was told it was going to be the Scarman style, I raised my eyebrows and was put a question against it, and I was shot down quite properly. Three years later, I went back to do some other work in South Africa, and uh, Janine Rausch and Mark Shaw told me they'd rewritten it to a South African model, and it's had gone down, right down to localities as well. So the South Africans actually learned that world solutions weren't the South African solution. Mm -hmm. That was the point I was going to make. So it, that's the best, the best practice. Thank you. Right. Donald's questions on, is there too much copying of foreign constitutions and how do you deal with the uh, excluded women? I need to, to start I'm actually going to, what I hope is a temporary hearing problem and I'm not catching enough. Right. Well, I think okay. that John have, have another go. Shall I do it? <laughs> okay. So I've, uh, I'm asking you, Many of these uh, fragile states we have today have come about as a result of the winner take all constitutions. Mm. Winner take all constitutions. I'm not getting it. Winner take all. So, I, I take the Colonel's point, yeah, I think, is yeah. that um, some of these fragile states have a situation where the, the electoral system and the mm. constitutional arrangements give total victory to the victor mm -hmm. and the minority population or ethnic group or religious or tribal group can again get uh, completely ignored and don't have their rights and, and how much is that the source of the problem? Mm. 
So I have a very loud voice from shouting in Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> and allied to that, had there been too much copying of foreign constitutions, and he made the specific point of the Kenyan constitution, constitution that's gone from more Westminster to more US. Mm -hmm. But perhaps just on this issue of um, security and corruption and um, I'm way out of my comfort zone on these issues. Um, the point I suppose I really want to make is that I fear that too much attention is paid to constitution making. Expectations are too high. Um, international community does that as well. Um, and other matters are not, and enough attention is not paid to other matters. Um, and of course, there's a <coughs> da danger of generalization for every, I mean, that's why academics write with so many footnotes. Um, you know, for every generalization, one can instantly think of exceptions, and Egypt is a complicated one. Because <laughs> I don't think it's quite as simple as one or the other, but um, Demons really illustrates that point. Um, now, Somalia may be another. Um, on the question of, of Kenya, well, I mean, we can talk about electoral systems. You know, I have preferences, and I said we all go in with preferences. Um, I, I suppose just on the constitutional design position, it takes us right back to this problem that people are very loath to go for something they don't understand. Mm. Or they, no, no, not don't understand, that's not right, are not familiar with. Mm. Um, the Kenyans instructed us in revising the constitution to use the... American model. It was at a time when Obama and um, Congress were in complete deadlock, so it seemed a particularly interesting instruction. But um, that is what it was. So yes, you see those elements in the Kenyan constitution without some of the safeguards. Um, and you now see it reproduced, as you suggested, in the 47 devolved units, um, with as a South African friend of mine, Man like saying, you know, you've either got one big corruption or many, many, many little corruptions. Um, perhaps you have a bit of both in Kenya at the moment. Um, you know, sometimes a model that looks interesting would be something Swissish, you know, where you actually do have people around the table, their identity problems perhaps attached to those. But again, people are seldom open to exploring new ideas. And I don't think that fully answers your question, but. It's a frustration. The options seem so broad, and in fact, they're very narrow. And the winner takes all the shoot. Same. Same thing. Well, back to Kenya. I mean, in Kenya, that's what they chose. They were offered a parliamentary system which softens the winner takes all, I think, um, in important ways. And they all went for a presidential system, believing <coughs> they would all win. Um, then. You know, again, it's a dis constitutional design question, I suppose. Can you do resource distribution in ways that are trusted and legitimate to ease those problems? Um, you know, this is a long conversation. You had a question for Praveen as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can I uh, just cover some of the other issues, if you don't mind, very quickly as well. On security and corruption, you're absolutely right. And South Africa's more recent example is, is a case in point. Mm where the key uh, repressive or enforcement arms of the state uh, are inverted commas captured by putting in the right people at the top, creating the wrong kind of culture. You can walk around and do things with impunity as far as corruption is concerned, because you know you won't be prosecuted or investigated. So that, that, that is a challenge. And how you overcome that is, I think, a problem that uh, we should all share. Uh, on the question of best practice, I have a view which, which says that there's nothing wrong with uh, understanding what might appear to be best practice, provided you've got a mind of your own. And that, uh, as Keith was saying, you understand your own local conditions, you understand what your needs are, and you're able to take your own needs and what best, best practices have to offer, and if you like, concoct a, a local version, uh, which involves an element of creativity, which links to the, the winner-take-all. In, in our first two years of government, Post-1994, we had a government of national unity. Three political parties participated. Mm -hmm. The ANC, the National Party, uh, and the Encarta Freedom Party until 1996, uh, when some of them walked out at, at, at that point in time. And, and the government of national unity, uh, in addition to our <coughs> approach to 
the question of the economy and making sure that the economic elites who are largely white didn't walk out with their capital, uh, the first two finance ministers didn't come from the ANC. They all lasted a year each, but uh, they came from either the private sector or the, the first one from the National Party. So these were the extraordinary efforts that uh, the ANC and Nelson Mandela made in order to keep continuity and change going at the same time. And I think there's some interesting lessons uh, as, as well. Uh, we also have interesting lessons to offer on mm. federalism and different varieties of federalism. Uh, because the ANC was uh, uh, a, a unity oriented uh, party, whereas others wanted a form of confederalism. Uh, where very few, the, the center was weak and, and the periphery was strong, which then links to Donald's point about provinces, that the, the shape of the provinces was uh, a negotiated compromise, that they would have concurrent powers in key areas, a few uh, original powers in, the, in their own right, but concurrency gave the appearance of sharing responsibility uh, but it creates its own difficulties because it creates all sorts of gray zones, as Christina would be able to, to explain. So school books. Uh, the, the province is responsible for buying and delivering school books. The, the, the question is, does that mean that the national department must abdicate from its responsibility to have oversight uh, over those provinces? So that issue arose. The second is greedy new elites coming into the picture which says, uh, how do we get into this tender process? How do we make money? How do we double the price? Uh, which leads to all sorts of inefficiencies as, as well. And in effect, the poor delivery uh, that, that you mentioned. Does it result in uh, legitimacy issues? It does, but not necessarily fragility. But it does uh, show a weakness in the entire uh, governmental system uh, that we have learned a lot of lessons from. But it still takes political courage to rectify those lessons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got um, Paul, and then Jennifer, and then Manoush. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a, perhaps a radical interpretation of what Mr. Larby and Professor Murray are saying. <coughs> so let me put it out, and then you can tell me that it's, that it's not right. Um, also introduces Mr. Gordon a bit from. So the, the proposition is that um, the Tunisia, actually the, the early regime which worked in the transition was the, your own government of technocrats, um, uh, which was brought in you know, sort of almost in desperation um, after the failure of an elected government to retain legitimacy for any <coughs> length of time. As you said, just winning an election didn't, didn't do the trick of giving legitimacy. Um, and your own technocratic government, if I paraphrase you, sort of knew that you didn't really have much legitimacy. Um, and I want to suggest that's actually a source of strength in a, an early fragile state context, not a source of weakness. It's the governments in a fragile state that think they have legitimacy that is bloody dangerous. Because in a fragile state situation, as Professor Murray sort of suggested, there's no real basis for, um, for a set of rules which is everybody says that's legitimate. Whoever wins on those rules, that's fine. You just can't do it. The preconditions for that sort of agreement are not there. There's too many hostilities, fears, uncertainties, unpredictabilities. So, um, so my interpretation of what you did was recognize created a government which recognized it just didn't have much legitimacy. And so what it better do about it was, was two things. One, you said communicate, communicate, communicate. And I take it from that, I might be wrong, that part of that communication was both to discover what people wanted <coughs> and then to think what was feasible to do and promise what you thought was feasible on a fairly short time horizon. And then you set about doing it. And that was, a, you got a sort of conditional trust from the population based upon 
okay, you seem to be promising things <coughs> that you claim are going to be feasible, and it's certainly the things we want. We'll give you a conditional trust as long as you then show signs of delivery. And you seem to, to have shown <laughs> some signs of delivering, and that was, that was seen enough. And what I want to take from Professor Murray that's pertinent for that is that, if you like, getting an early constitution is actually a real impediment for that process of humility in early governance. What you had, I think, was, was the huge asset of humility, recognizing you didn't have much trust. And I think to its immense credit, the ANC demonstrated that in those first two years of choosing to build a coalition because, of course, you've got the trust of the majority. That wasn't an issue. The question for you was, how do you retain an element of trust from the minority? Mm. And the way you did that, and this is my final suggestion, the way you did that was not by a load of promises, but by just putting into government people who were of the identity of the minority. So my final suggestion is, who is in government matters in those early stages more than the rules. If you've got a very divided society, you better have a, a government that's made up from the, the various, as it were, hate groups. And they, by forcing them to work together, that buys a conditional trust. Um, anyway, so that, that's the sort of proposition, but it, it's very heretical in terms of <coughs> what the UN prescription for fragile states is, so I'm prepared to be shot down. Right, the Collier thesis, right? Um, <laughs> Christina, why didn't you go first? Um, is that heretical? It doesn't, I mean, it's... It... Um, I mean, what you just said um, resonates a little bit with um, a distinction I try and make between people who bear power and people who exercise responsibility. And it is interesting how difficult it is to infuse constitution-making discussions with the sense that you're establishing a government that is a responsible body rather than a government that's a power-wielding body. So just sort of to, uh, I think there's a similarity between what you're saying and, and that concern. Um, I suppose my question would be, I mean, so South Africa and Tunisia look similar um, on that sort of construction of yours. But what encourages or enables a state to recognize um, their weakness instead of to hide it and push against it and, and in fact veer almost instantly back to really power wielding and um, pillaging predatory attitudes of government? Um, I think that must be the, I mean, for me, that would be wise. Kenya, probably perhaps not a fragile state, perhaps working at it, I don't know. Um, you know, why did Kenya so quickly go back to the winner takes all, a quite brutal politics? Um, and why we perhaps hope, but South Africa and Tunisia, I think, are struggling at the moment with keeping away from that. Um, so that's possibly the core question for the fragile state issue is, where does that distinction lie? Because your scenario is far preferable to most of the ones I know. <laughs> Yeah. And also, Charles, what you said about spending more time on trying to get political agreement before you have the constitution, because if you do that, you might end up with Paul's scenario mm -hmm. anyway. Sorry, I'm leaving my microphone. Um, it's lovely. Yeah. I, I think you are absolutely right. That was the point, in particular, when we felt that people were saying that you have the legitimacy, this quartet, in particular, led, and I will come to Milush's question. I'm sorry, I didn't answer it about the civil society. You have the support. We thought that was not there. It was not that much, at least. And the second was we we, came, we, we didn't trust that much the, the political actors around and the politicians. And we thought that at some time we were going to be hit. So the, the thing is really to get the trust of the people rather than the trust of the political actors. That was the, so I fully agree with you that that feeling of lack of legitimacy got us on our toes to uh, actually engage and deliver to the people uh, rather than to the politician and the political parties. And you are, uh, and that's it. So maybe that was a kind of weight 
that was not there. It requires another type of leadership, another way of doing things. Uh, and, and the other thing is that we wanted to make sure that we have the capacity to deliver. Because even if you want to engage the people and you kind of agree on a priority, the few priorities, you better make sure that you can deliver. And that's fundamental. So we worked a lot on this. And we made sure that at least on the priorities we thought. Uh, and the third, we actually engage in a little bit of, uh, I would say, a smart technocratic politics, where we wanted actually to engage with the people on the things that we have never discuss, discussed in our society. We need this revolution, but for what? Is it really for this kind of economic dignity and so on and so forth? Or we want to really to change the, the development model, but also what is our societal project? And what are the, our shared values and purpose? And we engage the whole national, what you call it, a national social dialogue for two months with different, actually, uh, civil society, etc. Uh, our aim was not to get to something. Our aim is to bring people to debate on some important issues like <coughs> values, purpose, etc., that we have never raised. So why we raised the issue of identity? when the Islamists came in and say, by the way, we don't have an identity, now we're going to give you an identity. Do you really, we really we believe that we don't have an identity? And that was fundamental, actually. Now people are asking again for it. So because they wanted to engage in a more, uh, just a quick, Milush, I'm sorry, on, on, I think she's absolutely right, that Tunisia probably has another type of ritual, which is, the, I would say, the strength of civil society. And the difference between civil society that I saw in different other countries and Tunisia is fundamental. Most of the donor and international community focused, and I was working with the World Bank, focused on, on actually helping and building civil society, mostly in social and economic fields, OK? Deliver to schools, education, health, and so on, public services, etc. In Tunisia, it was a no-go with Ben Ali, because he thought that's the way for this international and bilaterals to come and kind of influence and build people. But, and so civil society uh, the, on the economic and social was sort of NGOs created by his political party. But the political civil society and was not under his purview, and he was a kind of dealing with them. But they have never been captured by the political system. In particular, the trade union, UGTT. The labor unions is extremely strong, and even the strongest institution today. And why is it strong? Because this is the institution that started the independence movement in 1924. So no one single part political party was there. It was the, the first institution that faced uh, France at that time and the uh, colonialism. It was the one that paid the price during the movement, etc. So it has a strong legitimacy. And up to today, this is only the institution that fought for social kind of improvements during this whole revolution. Now the cost of trade union, in my humble view, is much higher. For, 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 for Tunisian society and for Tunisian, actually, economy, than actually what they really brought in this transitional process. Because that's why we have are in a, in a very bad situation economically. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Jennifer. I have some questions that are related. Uh, first to uh, Mr. Larby, uh, you say communicate, communicate, communicate. It's tough to deliver a service everywhere all at once. So I'm curious about what you said out on the ground to the people who would be served second or third and not first. How did you persuade them that they too would receive this service or this benefit uh, down the road? Was it all setting up the timetable? Or were there other ways you could sort of bring them along in that? And then to, uh, to Mr. Gordon, I. How did you get people to pay taxes or uh, rates, uh, utility rates? And uh, so what, was, what were the compelling arguments that you could offer, and which kinds of arguments just didn't work at all? Um, Pravin, why don't you go first on this one? Uh, yeah, tax payment is never a happy exercise, <laughs> uh, as you know. So in, in our situation, I suppose we, we learned a model from, well, here's an example of best practice. So the Swiss, I mean, the Swedes taught us that you need a, a balance between enforcement and service. Enforcement of different sorts 
against people with different levels of non-compliance and good service to the compliant uh, taxpayer. We added a South African bit to it, a third element called education, because now you had a lot of people in South Africa who were outside of the economic system, didn't know what tax payment meant or why uh, it should be done. But in addition, during the struggle years, we also told people not to pay uh, service charges the one uh, or the other, and boycott was uh, uh, an important tool uh, in the struggle process as, as well. So that combination of education, enforcement, and service was, was a critical factor. Secondly, building an effective institution. We don't have time to go into details, but within about five or six years since 1998, we totally transformed the tax and customs uh, institution. Thirdly, uh, what Danny Roderick will call the demonstration effect. Mm. You can't theorize about these things. You've got to actually show that if Cameron doesn't pay his tax, you're going to act against him, despite the fact that he's Cameron. And the same with Collier as well. Uh, so if you, if you choose a few good examples and demonstrate that you have the ability to enforce the law as it should be uh, and that the non-compliant will be dealt with uh, on a fair basis and within the law, uh, then it works. But the willingness of politicians at a senior level to tolerate this uh, is an important factor because you, you can do it on a very narrow scale and then when you attack sensitive spots in society, uh, high net worth individuals or big companies that are transgressing the law, uh, the politician mustn't come to you and say stop or take it easy or give this guy a break or whatever the case might be. And we were very fortunate at that time that uh, the politicians involved didn't interfere and they allowed these things to actually happen, including the transformation of the institution itself. And the last is to show the benefits of paying tax that if you pay, you get and the improvement you see in the health service or in education or in uh, infrastructure being built, there's a direct relationship between the two. Uh, and we, amongst the staff, uh, developed not just a technical understanding, but also a higher purpose. You're building South Africa through this process as well. And that higher purpose really motivated people to go out there and do extraordinary things as well. But uh, there's also a flip side. And that is that in as much as it takes you 10 or 15 years to build an institution, it takes you one year to destroy it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, just put in the wrong two or, two or three top people into the institution, they begin to do the wrong thing. So we mustn't romanticize this as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Abhi, do you want to come back? On, on the communication, it's true that it's a little bit complicated. And I must say that we were not that much successful, but we did much better than the previous transition governments. But we were very selective. Uh, the thing that helped us very much was the freedom of expression that we really got after the appraising. And up to now, if there is something that is tangible from this appraising, is that is freedom of expression where it is it's, it's fundamental. Uh, we did two things. Uh, one is to communicate on things that we achieve. And and this, we started with something that we thought very sensitive to the people at, this, at, that, at that time. By the way, we rejected somehow to call on communication specialists and agents, etc., because it was so complicated. And we said, people would like, like to see whether we are going to address this terrorism, this jihadism or not. And we started by cleaning the mosques, because the mosques were kind of if invaded by the Salafists, etc. And we have like 5,000. And in three months, we cleared like 3,500. And every day, we say, we kind of liberated such and such mosques. And now we are putting people who are more. That was extremely important. We started building some trust because people said they are very serious about getting back to uh, what they uh, promised to do. And the jihadism also. Uh, we actually uh, collaborated with different other countries who have m much more actually, uh, in a way, experience, but also the means to do it. And we didn't hesitate actually to attack the different uh, nests here and there. We arrested, and that's we communicate to radio, TV. Now, when it comes to public service, and that's fundamental where you go down, we uh, announced actually what we wanted to do. Uh, we did it first at the central, at the ministry's level, so that the people would talk to their families, their people, etc., to the newspaper, in the social media, but also we did it at the regional level. Apparently, it didn't trickle down up to what we wanted to see, 
but we people saw <coughs> some improvement in public services in road condition etc and so on. Uh, health, uh, education, not that much in education, to be frank with you, in terms of quality, but in a number of other things that we're actually missing. Thank you. We're going to have Manoush's question, then we're going to have a five-minute coffee break before coming back again, but okay. last question before we break. Okay. Um, so in fragile states, sequencing is always a dilemma. What, what do you do first? And I wanted to ask you, you know, this, the, the to-do list is so long. Do you write a constitution? Do you hold an election? Or do you go with some kind of coalition, transitional government? Do you do security sector reform? Or do you repair the roads and build the schools? And so I just wanted to ask you, in your experience, you know, and obviously the easy answer is oh, you do everything at the same time. And by definition, you can't, because capacity is the biggest constraint in a fragile state. So in your experience, what comes first? Sequencing. Mm -hmm. What had the biggest so impact on state legitimacy? That's an excellent question. Let's have a very brief answer from each of you, and then we can have a coffee break. Christine, what? <laughs> right, what would you do first? Ideally, you do everything at the same time. You uh, hold elections, you have constitutions, you have uh, transitional governments, you build roads, you form police forces, but life isn't like that. Uh, we're trying to be practical and hard-headed, and Manoush's question is, given there's a lack of capacity, what's the, what do you put first? From the lens of state legitimacy. The answer sound like a dodging answer. But That's all right. I'm a politician. I'm used to hearing those. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Um, you know, I said a moment ago, yeah. one has, I think, usually very, very little choice. Um, so it depends on the circumstances of the country. The need. Circumstances really dictate things, and it's <coughs> easy to say, well, in Yemen they got things in the wrong order. Much less easy in 2011. I mean, something that's emerging from all our discussions is security. Physical security probably has to come first. Mm. Uh, if you want to well, a ceasefire. Day. Yes, yeah, exactly. But, okay. Quick yeah. answers for everybody else? Yeah. Quick answer. It's really context type of specific. Indeed, security is fundamental for the people. I would start there. But in our case, when we came in, it was really engaging with the people so that they kind of... Felt ownership. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and they define, they will tell you, we would like to see this. And that's, you can, you make up your mind on what you want to do. A, context matters. B, in our, in our situation, an interim solution. So we were first negotiated an interim constitution, uh, which created sufficient conditions for an election to be held. And there wasn't total peace, there was mm. violence, there was yeah. uh, all sorts of reaction from the other side as well. And once you pass a critical point, uh, it's probably the tipping point, then the rest begins to flow. Keith? Stabilization. Stabilization. Yeah. And can I just add a little bit to it? And once you've completed the stabilization, you've got to sequence in, in the right order, the things that uh, you, you've aged.